All right, patient transfer. Um, and some of this has changed, right? Uh, since when I was uh, in school. So um, I wanna talk about what's real and what's, um, what to be expected. Um, Cause there's some stuff that we should probably discuss that's actually not in the chapter, in the textbook reading, but there's some stuff I wanna really underline in our chapter two. So here's uh, some learning objectives. Uh, we want to make sure that we can list two steps to be taken to ensure accuracy of patient identification, right? And we kind of went over that last week with the aided stuff, right? Acknowledge them. The I is identify them, right? Because I guarantee you, y'all are y'all familiar with aided, right? Guarantee to you in your first week of clinic, you're going to go out and call for Miss Mr. Smith or whoever. Mr. Jones is going to pop up. You'll get him back in that hallway and. and start to ask them those questions and realize, no, you need to go sit your butt down because you confused Smith with Jones, right? Um, so you're crazy, man. Like, that's wild. I don't even want to be around you anymore. No, I mean, it's like you don't want to be giving Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones' x-rays. That'd be a problem, really big problem, misdiagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's important, especially if you're thinking about from a transfer point of view because you don't want to be transferring a patient down to the department and then you realize, oh, my gosh, i got to wheel this person all the way back up because it's the wrong patient. Not that I've ever done that. Um, then demonstrate safe techniques for moving and transferring patients, right? Um, and so we'll stress kind of good body mechanics and that's what we're going to get into the lab to practice um, for wheelchairs, for uh, stretcher transfers. Um, I said that someone stole my smooth mover, so we'll I've got something like a smooth mover. It's kind of, I don't know, we'll see. Um, I, gate belts and uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, one thing that you really want to, like one kind of rule of thumb, this kind of last objective is, well, there's not really a way to demonstrate this, but in general, you want to support people on the weaker side. right? So as I'm talking to the patient, I'm trying to get a feel for where are they hurting the most, what parts can they do for themselves, and what parts do they maybe need some assistance on? And also, how aware of that are they, right? Um, I'm thinking in particular about a man, I'm gonna tell you a really gross and weird clinical story, right? So I was a second year student, and there was a man that was transferred down to the apartment, so I did not do the transfer. He was brought down in a wheelchair, he communicated to the transfer people that he could he could stand, he could get in a wheelchair, et cetera, et cetera. And so he's there for, ch for a chest x-ray. I go into the room with him, he's sitting in a wheelchair, so I assume he can stand, he's in a wheelchair, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all right, sir, can you stand for the chest x-ray, right? He's, he struggles with standing, right, getting up out of the wheelchair. Um, he was not wearing a gait belt. And, but he said he could stand. He was really insistent that he could stand. And the chest x-ray board did have like handholds on it. So he gets up there. He um, stands for the, for the PA chest x-ray for the, the first image, get the picture. And he starts saying that he's, he's feeling weak. He's out of breath. Um, and he starts to collapse while he's standing there, right? And I ran out, right? and caught this guy just as he was about to collapse. And he was a very heavy dude, right? He was a big dude. Um, but I caught him, but he, I could not, he literally just had become dead weight, right? In my arms. And so I am screaming for help, right? Which is, this is not normally a good sign that like the person's competent with what they're doing. Um, screaming for help because I'm alone in the department. And this man proceeds to tell me, I really need to use the bathroom, right? I was like, sir, can you please hold on to that? <laughs> hold on to that thought. Let me, let me get you. He's like, no, I really need to go. And I was like, oh, sir. <laughs> he, he, he pooped all over me. Um, yeah, that happened. Um, fortunately, I was wearing a lead apron, so it kind of was like this flak jacket type thing. And eventually a tech did come in and help me out of this predicament that I've gotten myself into. Um, so 
demonstrating the correct method for assisting patients on the weak side includes assessing the patient for how honest and truthful they are, right, about whether or not they can stand, right? So observing people closely, being a much better student of people than I was, you know, um, and just because someone says they can do something, it doesn't mean, especially when you're dealing with an a older population, that they can. What it means is that I wish I could, you know. I wish I could still drive a car. I wish I could still stand. I can stand. I will do it, you know. Um, so, I hope that man doesn't remember me. Um, <laughs> moving on, though. Uh, so, that um, there are some precautions we can take particularly with things like surgical hip replacements. I'm not gonna get lost in the weeds on the hip replacement thing though, because um, the best thing you can do is talk to the nurse. What kind of, what did the doctor say? What's in the chart about how the patient can move? And normally the patient's really educated on it as well. So just take the patient at their word for that. Um, we'll be transferring, uh, we'll be doing some two person transfer stuff. So that's one of the reasons I bumped this up to our, our basically our second class session is this is a bit like one of those trust fall exercises, you know what I mean? Where we're gonna be in the lab, like moving each other onto the table and stuff, yeah. Don't drop anyone. <laughs> um, we'll use draw sheets, slider boards, and I have a sliding mat, not a slider board, and it's really not a sliding mat. I'm just gonna call it a sliding mat. Um, I stole it from a different lab. And we'll talk about safe use of safety rails and stuff. Um, just know that anytime you see the word safety, like um, this is the stuff that nursing loves, right? And a big part of your job is to make sure that the nurses love you, right? Um, because if the nurses love you, it means that you're doing whatever you're doing is keeping patients safe. Like, Believe it or not, when I took the man who crapped on me back up to the floor, the nurses did not love me, right? Um, it wasn't as though I got any sympathy from the floor nurses for this guy pooping all over me. You know, zero sympathy there. They're like, you dumb A, you know? Um, so nurses are super into the whole safety thing, and as well they should be, right? So if you want nurses to like you, practice safety stuff. Be aware that they are like the safety gurus, right? And if there's ever a question about how safe something is, ask a nurse. Like, the good nurses will love to talk to you about that. They like to talk about safety and quality. Those two things are really important to nurses. So some key terms. We'll talk about what a draw sheet is, the gate belt, orthostatic hypotension, which basically means if you sit up too fast, you pass out. Um, sedation, um, slider boards and sliding mats. All right. Anytime we're moving people around, and the first thing I want you to underline in your chapter is sentence two. Patients may believe they can walk to the radiology department, but they must not be allowed to do so star man crapped on Benny, right? <laughs> like, whatever you gotta do to remember that. Um, probably the population that this is most difficult with is like teenagers and 30-somethings, right? I can walk, gee, day it, you know? Um, especially if they're strung out on drugs where they shouldn't be walking, they'll be very insistent that like they can walk, right? I know you can walk, that's great. You can also sit your freaking butt down in this wheelchair and let me push you over to the department, right? And if you don't like that, I can come back later and make you wait 15 minutes, right? Um, because it's a significant safety consideration. That person is now under your care, and so having them with wheels on them is better than having them walk around, right? So I can't stress it enough. Wheel your patients to the department, right? Don't walk them, even if they're cool and the guy's kind of cute and you think maybe he might like you if you let him walk to the department. Screw that noise. Like, shouldn't be dating patients anyways. Um, Mr. Roberts said that, and it's somewhere in one of these books. I don't remember where, but in the Bible it probably says it too. So, it's like, thou shalt not date patients. Um, but uh, wheel them to the department. There will be some people who say, no, I'm going to walk. No, you're not. Like, you gotta get in this wheelchair. I'm sorry, it's not cool. 
Blame it on the hospital. It's the policy, right? Blame it on the doctor. This is what the doctor said. Blame it on whoever you want, you know, but make sure that the patient um, is wheeled to the department. It's really the only way to ensure they're safe transportation because what happens if they have some alteration in consciousness what happens if they have some alteration in status what happens if all of a sudden they need to poop and also their legs go out from underneath them like those kinds of things are legit questions you have to start asking as of today right um, only use a wheelchair for those people who are sitting upright able to tell you who the president is right um, aware of how funny all of your jokes are, you know what I mean? People who are alert is the medical term that we use for this. Awake and alert. If they look the least bit drowsy, they're complaining constantly about the pain that they're in, um, they seem the least bit shaky as you're watching them move, or the least bit disoriented, just go ahead and use a stretcher, right? The wheelchair is basically like like the kind of the nice car, right? If you're being nice, you get to go in the nice car. Otherwise, we're putting you in the stretcher, right? Um, so start schooling yourself on how to get to know people, right? And so small talk actually becomes our friend, right? What's the weather like outside? I don't know. Okay, this guy didn't observe the weather outside. That seems suspicious. Who's the president? You know, like, let's start talking about the president. How about those Yankees, right? Um, what's the Yankees? What does that have to do with anything? Okay, he's not watching baseball. Like, just start asking them questions, right? Can you tell me what your name is? Harriet Tubman. No, okay. The, you are going in a stretcher bed. As if, like, you just don't know the president, don't know what the weather is outside, you think you're Harriet Tubman, all right? All right, so, um, yeah, stretchers used for those too weak to sit or who are very confused or embattled or who are incarcerated and are sort of shackled to things, those kind of, yeah. You will deal with people who have come from penal farm and things like that. If they got handcuffs on them, they go on a stretcher bed because you got to keep them locked up to something. And it's much harder to throw a stretcher than it is to throw a wheelchair at someone. Like, if I was going to get hit with something by someone, I think I would take the stretcher over the wheelchair Unless it was the Incredible Hulk, right? If the Incredible Hulk's going hit, to hit me with something, just, I don't know, just get it over with. I'm not going to live. Um, small children need to be transported in cribs, right? That's, that's significant. And by, I mean babies, but also like anyone who could fit in a crib, transfer them in a crib. Now, children, are you're going to realize, are a significant pain in everyone's butt, right? They're really cute. But they are like space aliens. They're, they are narcissistic space aliens, right? <laughs> their heart rates are different. Their breathing rates are different. Their brains are thinking really weird things. Like about Elsa from Frozen. <laughs> constantly. Like that's all they can think about. And that's all they talk about, right? Um, and they're completely self-obsessed. There's literally no one else in the world except for them right um so they make everyone's life a hell right i love children i love working with kids they're a lot of fun but you have to understand wherever kid goes there's like a freaking entourage or something right um and so just come prepared to deal with mom or dad um normally mom dad's playing video games somewhere <laughs> kids in the hospital um uh but yeah um work with the mom and be really real with the mom. Because kids can smell fear like nothing else, right? They can smell fear. But the nice thing about kids is if they're too weak to stand, they are already wearing a diaper so they won't crap all over you, right? Like, let's be honest here. I um, mean, they are pretty easy to distract with cell phones. Little tip. I'll talk more about working with kids because that's something that I do quite a bit of, and I'm, I know I'm kind of joking around right now, but the, the important thing is, is if you're transferring them, they should come with some kind of transfer thing that allows you to transfer them like a crib. Don't sit mom down in a wheelchair and have baby in mom's lap, that's what I'm saying. Actually not a good way to transfer. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they do at women's, I think they primarily use cribs. Definitely, if, if, if for, for whatever reason the crib's not available and you're dealing with like a, a child younger than two, um, then 
you uh, you could talk to the nurse and say, okay, is it okay if they have mom sitting in the, ask the nurse again, like safety question, how do we do this? What's our protocol here? So, but ask the nurse there. Because just recognize you're kind of in a gray area. About gray areas real quick. You will get thrown under the bus by technologists. And I hate to tell you that, right? I'm just being completely real with you. Um, this is all joking aside. They are going to throw you under the bus if you're not careful. So knowing some of this stuff and knowing what the protocols are are, are super important. Um, so anytime we're dealing with patient oxygen, right, EKG leads, stuff like that, um, I'm not going to overwhelm you with a bunch of stuff that's not what we're talking about today. But just know that there are policies at Baptist in particular that you should not be touching that stuff. But the technologist will send you to transfer the patient because they know that you don't know that policy, right? And they can get the patient back that much more quickly, right? Um, so if you're being asked to disconnect patients from oxygen, know that there's a policy on that and you should be doing it apart from the nurse's knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Because oxygen's technically a drug, it's ordered by the physician, things like that. So I'm not trying to scare you or anything, but just because the tech says, oh, it's okay, is it? Tech says it's okay, but who did I say was the safety guru? Yeah. The nurse. So I would say ask the nurse before I ask the tech. If it's anything about safety, what techs know is how to look at people's bones, right? What nurses know is safety stuff. So if you ever feel like you're in a, in a gray area, don't ask the tech if it's about safety. Ask the patient's nurse. So right here we got check with nursing services and obtain the chart. Now this has kind of gone the way of the dodo, but we used to literally have to grab the patient's chart, go find the patient's chart before we could transfer them. For the most part now we use an electronic medical record, right? So it's helpful to check the the EMR before you go into the patient's room and you know kind of a little bit about the patient. Um, but it was really nice actually when we had physical charts because you could flip through the chart real quickly and just say, okay, this is what, they've done this, 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 and this. This is what their vital signs were today. Okay, let's go. It was great. It was a little bit more convenient. Um, you'll want to check patient identification, right? Um, and that's not necessarily the first thing that you want to do. It, so I want to stress again, check the chart first, right? Because if the patient has a contact isolation and you go in to look at their wristband, guess what? You just contaminated yourself, right? So check the chart first. Is there contact stuff, whatever? What all's going on in this person's life? Can they really tell me their name and date of birth? All that kind of stuff. Um, it's really embarrassing, for example, to walk into a patient's room, ask them their name and date of birth, and have a family member say, don't you know this patient is deaf and mute? You know? because like they're sick of it. They're sick of people walking in there and not knowing just basic knowledge about this person. Um, but work with the patient to uh, understand their identification. Um, plan out your steps, right? Set a good foundation. Like have the room clean before you arrive. Have everything ready, the wheelchair ready before you roll into the room. Have your, everything ready, right? Um, and communicate with the patient throughout. So um, ask their help. A lot of times they're familiar with the equipment that is required for them to move around. People who have a catheter in their urethra are very familiar with the fact that they have a catheter in their urethra, right? And my mom, for example, she named her catheter bag, which is really strange, but my mom is strange, and I'll call her some occasionally in class so y'all can talk to her. Um, but they, she became very familiar with that catheter bag, right? Um, and so they, a lot of times patients know how best to help them, right? If they're aware of um, all that stuff. So let them know, we're going down to x-ray. Um, what all do I need to be watching out for while I'm helping you, right? Um, what are ways I can help you best? Oh, I'm fine. I can get up, you know. Okay, cool. Well, oh, oh, I have this catheter, you know. And so figure out the best place to situate that. Um, and then if in doubt at all, ask for help. Does it slow things down? Yes, it does. 
Um, but it is, I would much rather have a slow transfer than a transfer where someone gets hurt, if that's my choice. So, ask for help either from the nurse or from another tech. Familiarize yourself with the means for asking, whether it's phoning or, or using a pager system or whatever. All right, moving along. Bed to wheelchair transfers. Let me move this up. All right. First thing we're going to do if we're in a patient's hospital room is we're going to raise the head of the bed, right? Um, and it says lower the bed to wheelchair level. Um, I would just make sure that the bed is at wheelchair level or slightly above wheelchair level. Um, and, and then position the wheelchair parallel with the bed. If you look at um, this, it's not exactly parallel, these little helpful guy thing. You'll find that there's this kind of like little angle that's slightly off from parallel, but parallel to the bed is great. And you want it like pointing at the head of the bed, right? Because what you're going to do is like, say, um, you're going to kind of dance with the person. So they're going to have the head of the bed raised, they're going to get up on their feet, and you're just going to pivot with them and drop them in the wheelchair. Make sure that the wheels are locked on the bed and on the wheelchair. On the bed and on the wheelchair. Right? Um, they may need help underneath their knees, um, but the idea here is to get them to swing their heads off the side. If the patient has back pain, it may be easier for them um, if you lower the head of the bed and allow them roll up onto their side and then get up from their side. It's much more difficult for you, but um, it's easier for them. As they're sitting on the, on the side of the bed, um, that's a really good time to make sure that they've got something covering their feet. Because hospital floors are cold and disgusting, right? Um, so uh, they, they have those little socks or whatever at the nursing station. Anytime I worked at the, in transferring, I'd always grab a little pair of socks, right? Because you know, a lot of people don't sit around with their socks on. So I had socks in my pocket. Um, that's, it's a good time, too, to check and make sure everything else is going on. Maybe ask the patient how they're doing because you just moved them from a laying down position to a seated position. And so the concern is, the reason I'm kind of slowing down in this moment is because of that orthostatic pressure thing, right? So if you're wondering where that comes in, here's where it comes in. When patients move from a, a laying down position to a seated position, they might get dizzy, right? the blood might kind of rush out of their head. Um, and it will take them, they're not gonna pass out, but if you were to get them up on their feet, yeah, they could pass out, right? So take a minute, see how they're doing, ask about their grandkids or whatever. So here's some illustrations of what that looks like, kind of each step. Um, and so I wanna point out why each one of these is important locking the wheelchair, right? And locking the stretcher bed, or locking the patient's bed. Raising the head of the bed, right? And having the, the wheelchair, you'll notice the stretcher's actually a little bit higher than the, than the wheelchair. And I think that's better because you're not fighting gravity so much. Um, then he's got the patient seated there, and he's got a hand on her shoulder, and he's asking her how she's doing. He's maybe helping her out with her, her slippers or whatever. Right. And the final thing is, like, we're going to do our little dance now. So, um, those, each one of those pictures are the, they're helpful pictures, right? That's the dance in. Happy patient. <laughs> Ding! All right.
Now, if a person is unsteady on their feet, like this guy, he looks really unhappy. Like, I don't know what's going on there, but... Um, they might have a gate belt or a transfer belt. Um, and so, I don't actually have one of these with me, I'm sorry. But it is, it is just a cloth belt that goes around the patient's center. And it gives you something to hold on to. Um, and uh, it allows you to um, kind of help the patient mobilize themselves, um, uh, make sure that you're talking with the patient, you're positioned behind the patient holding the gait belt, and uh, um, you can use that then to transfer them to the wheelchair as well. So. Um, you might be wondering, well, he said, you know, if the patient can't get up on their feet, just use a stretcher, right? Well, there are some folks, um, like this very unhappy gentleman here, he looks really sad about it, but um, who had, you know, they've had surgery or whatever, they're recuperating, and actually going down to x-ray is kind of an opportunity for them to get up and mobilize a little bit, right? So you're kind of playing a therapeutic role. Um, so if the nurse says, hey, yeah, I want to get him up on his feet a little bit, he's a little unsteady, but use the gait belt, he should be fine, right? Again, who's the safety guru? The nurse. She says use the gait belt, he'll be fine, right? There's no, what she's telling me is he doesn't have any risk of changing consciousness. He's awake and alert. I assessed his vital signs. They're healthy. They've been healthy for the last three days. He just had knee, a knee surgery. We need to get him up and moving around on his knee because he's just been sitting in the bed watching a reality TV show all day long, right? All right. One thing I'll see, and you'll see this in our wheelchair when we get into the lab, the footrests were clearly designed by an idiot um, because they, their primary function seems to be to trip everyone, right? Um, so be aware of that. When you're working with a wheelchair, is it there for safety? Yes. Does it have this one feature that's incredibly unsafe? Yes, it's the footrests. They're a pain in everyone's side, right? So be really aware of those footrests. If a wheelchair is in good functioning order, you should be able to toggle, like kind of swing them out of the way, and that's the best thing to do with them, is get them the frick out of the way or just remove them all together, and then once you've got the patient seated in the wheelchair, put the footrest back on, right? It is worth the extra time versus trying to wrangle with those things while you're helping a patient, especially if the patient's got a gait belt. So there's that un really unhappy man. Just like, life is meaningless. And he's like, no, it's actually worth living. It's okay, you just got this gait belt on. Would you call me? <laughs> All right. Bed to wheelchair transfers. Um, these are a fall risk is what I'm saying, right? Um, particularly when we get down to the seating part, right? Um, the best thing to do uh, is to instruct the patient to find the arm rests, right? Uh, most people naturally gravitate to the arm rests anyways, they're looking for them, right? But you, there are occasionally people who are like, I just, like, this is the wheelchair. And they're like, I just can't make it. And it's like, sir, sir, find the armrest. Um, so if they start to do, like, the pre-sit-down thing, it happens. Um, watch that, right? Um, and tell them to find the armrest. The other thing, I should mention this now with the smiling granny. Um, I don't know what this is about, right? I've never, I've never had a male patient do this to me, but the the sweet old ladies, the really sweet ones, the really nice ones, the nicer they are, the more likely are they're going to do this. They will do what I call hanky hand you. They've got a handkerchief in their hand, covered with their boogers, <laughs> and they think that's the best way to grab hold of your hand, is with this hanky hand, right? And it's like they hide them or something. It's like they're magicians, you know? It's like you're, you're watching for it. It's like, okay, does she have the hanky? Does she have? No, there's no hanky there. Oh, snap, there was a hanky. Um, so 
be aware of that. They seem really sweet and they are, and they are. They're really nice, but they they get some kind of sick pleasure <laughs> out of hanky handing people. <laughs> That's what I would say. We need to wear gloves for, even if they seem nice. And watch out for those hands. All right. And it's always like right after an in-service for like therapeutic touch. You know, it's really important to, to practice therapeutic touch, you know, and then you go out the first patient, hanky hand, oh! <laughs> All right, they didn't mention that in the in-service. All right. All right, now we got the x-ray table, which everyone loves because it's cold and it's hard and it's miserable, right? So go ahead and tell the patients, I got to take you down to the department and put you on this cold, miserable table. But I'm a really nice person. I'm really warm and friendly, <laughs> you know. Um, try to counterbalance it some with your personality. It doesn't help if, like, you are cold and hard and miserable, and you're also putting this person on a cold, hard, miserable thing. It's just no one's happy at that point. Although some technologists seem to think that will work. But again, we'll, pl we'll place the wheelchair now parallel to the x-ray table, lock the wheels, um, lock the, uh, move the footrest out of the frickin' way. Um, and then we can move some of these x-ray tables, we can adjust the height. If that's the case, get it as low as possible, right? Um, or at least uh, at the, at the knee, patient's knees, where their knees bend, right? Um, and it's the same thing, it's the same little dance, right? Um, assist them to stand, do the little waltz, and place them on the table, right? Um, they will tell you how cold the table is, even though you told them that the table is cold and hard. They'll also mention how hard it is. Um, and the best thing you can do is, once they're either laying down or whatever, is put a, a, a knee sponge underneath their knees and get them a warm blanket, right? And then get about, go on about your work. Uh, if for whatever reason, like in the floral room, if we look in our textbook, I'm looking on page, uh, where is that? I could have sworn it was in here somewhere. Yeah, here it is. On page uh, 218. I mean, this woman's a really good actress. They, she is working for her money. <laughs> I mean, she looks really uh, concerned about her safety in this one picture, like picture B. Um, but they're using a footstool to assist her up onto a fluoro table, right? Because the fluoro table won't lower anymore. So every one of the first things the patient will say is, I need that table to go down. And you say, no, it, the cold heart table doesn't go down. It doesn't like you. Um, <laughs> but get a footstool and help them up. Mm. With the floor table, if for, for whatever reason that's like completely not an option, there is some fancy stuff you can do where you can like tilt the entire floor table up and just have them step onto it and then lower it down. So there are some troubleshooting things here. I'm not going to get into the weeds on that, but um, okay, let me see where we at. Yeah, this is just more on the same thing. Um, if a patient, again, if they have got any kind of back pain, they may want to lay on their side prior to getting onto their back. And it may be required to use some kind of pad or something like that, right? There are radio lucent pads that we can place on the table. We prefer not to use them in most instances, but because um, it's just more to clean up. And, and also it, it could have contrast, it could create an artifact, right? Um, the best thing for most people is to get something underneath their knees. So if you look on page 219, I really dig this guy's method. He knows what he's about. He's easing her shoulders back while at the same time bringing her knees up. And, um, and he, since he's got the arm underneath her knees, he's, he can just really quickly, once he's got her head down on the pillow, slide something underneath her knees to support her knees and reduce the curvature of her spine so that she's more comfortable. All right, basically um, all of these folks make problems for wheelchair transfers and for the most part we're not doing wheelchair transfers for these people. 
Um, like stroke victims generally are going to come in a stretcher, right? Uh, fractures to the lower extremity generally going to come in a stretcher. Um, joint replacement. Um, again, talk to the nurse, but it may need to be a stretcher thing. Spine trauma or surgery, definitely a stretcher, right? Um, uh, if the patient cannot stand safely, right, and they're heavy, you may need to use some kind of hydraulic lift. I have literally never seen this thing in my whole life, right? But the textbook acts like it's like just one sitting in every department somewhere. Um, but uh, it looks like fun, actually. I mean, uh, but if you can find one, use the hydraulic lift. Um, all right, so this is the thing I said, let's not get lost in the weeds. Ooh, this is a bad slide. Um, I would just talk to the nurse on all of this stuff. Uh, the, you'll, you'll notice it's, it's much, it's completely illegible here, so let's look at the textbook. There's a nice little box in the textbook. Um, all this kind of stuff here. Basically, all this says is for either one, don't move the freaking leg, you know? And it's got some stuff like avoid adduction, avoid abduction, avoid internal external rotational. Okay, don't move the leg is what that just said, <laughs> like at all, don't move the leg. Um, so why are we even talking about this? It just said, don't move the leg, and ditto for the other one, don't move the freaking leg, like end of story. So my thing is don't move the leg, right? If it's They've had a hip replacement. <laughs> They're in a lot of pain. If you've ever seen one of those operations, it's it's like they were working on a car. Like they've opened up the hood and they're pulling stuff out and pounding on metal things, and it's intense. All right, stretchers. We got three methods for stretcher transfer, and this is uh, also illustrated here in our textbook. They're all kind of the same thing, right? It's the same basic idea. And this, if there's gonna be one where you'll jack your back up, it's the stretchers thing. So I've told you the wheelchair is the nice car. It's nicer on you too because, you know, the patient is, has a little bit more agency to help you move. Like if, if you've ever been laying down, like it, we should all do an exercise where we have to lay down on the floor and try to move to the door, right? It takes a long time to get to the door versus if we were sitting in a chair trying to scoot to the door, we could get there quicker, right? That's the problem with stretcher stuff. The patient is now completely out of the equation for helping you. They are literally just dead weight. Not trying to be mean, but don't say that in front of the patient. Um, but they're not going to be helping you. Uh, what you need is either a draw sheet, a slider board, or a sliding mat. So we're going to look at both the draw sheet and the slider mat in there, right? The one that you will see the most is the smooth mover, which is the one that I said someone stole from me, right? That's the thing that That's cool. They just moved it over. I don't know what that is, but I want one already. <laughs> um, it may be some kind of inflatable sliding mat thing. That's cool. Because it's easier to step underneath them or whatever. Yeah, they just like put it under the patient, they blew it up, and then it would just move people, and it was so easy. Wait, was this like a dream of the future? <laughs> like in the future, people will be moved on air mats. And no, I, uh, I'll need to see that. I mean, clearly I've been out of the clinic teaching in the college, so they, they're changing things on me. Um, but I want to, uh, yeah, that sounds like the way that I want to get around. Yeah, like Aladdin kind of, right? Like the flying carpet. No, I, I, that is, that's exactly the same thing. Yeah. So these, these methods basically, we're stuffing something. So we, we have two people, right? One person's going to be the person on the patient side, the other person's going to be the person on the stretcher side. So the person on the patient's side tells the patient, roll up onto your side, or they roll the patient up onto their side. The other tech pushes something underneath the patient, pushes the slider board underneath the patient, right? Um, then you pull the patient onto the slider board, and you can either go ahead and pull the whole operation over onto the stretcher, or you can just slide them across the board onto the stretcher, right? Generally, the person pulling has the harder job, right? So we see that illustrated here. 
here is how difficult it is to scoot your booty over onto the stretcher, right? On this illustration. She is not happy. This, we do not see the smiling granny in this picture, right? This is a difficult way to move. Um, now she's happy. They're moving her. And they've got this thing underneath their draw sheet, and they're pulling her over on the draw sheet. The, if you want to see the technologist a little bit more happy, it's this thing. They slide the patient up onto, they roll the patient up onto the side, they put the smooth mover board underneath her, and then they slide her across, right? Now one thing that we haven't really talked about, um, but the, the glaring omission here is backboards, right? You will have patients from the ER that are transferred to the department in a stretcher on a backboard. A lot of times they'll be wearing a C-spine collar, right? These are the people who have been banged up in a car accident or something, right? In the case of the backboard, you probably need two, maybe three people to pick up the backboard and move the, pa move the patient over on the backboard, right? Don't take them off the backboard, anything like that. Um, the reason I say you need three people to do that is because two of them basically are lifting on either side of the patient, and the third person is holding their head, making sure that their head's not flopping around since they're in a C-spine collar. That makes sense. So you might want to write on this uh, slide that backboards just move the whole freaking backboard with three people. All right, safety and side rails. You would not think that this would be complicated, but it kind of is. Um, if you are moving the patient on a stretcher bed, they need to be up in a locked position. So that's for patients who are impaired unconscious during transport when patients are left unattended on the stretcher, which we probably shouldn't do anyways, right? Um, but say you get down to the department, you did all this work to get the patient down to the department, no one likes you or whatever, nurses are mean, and now you got the x-ray rooms taken up. They, someone needs to go in and use the x-ray room. Um, if you have to park the patient out in the hall, do it with... Um, both the side rails up. The reason I say this is kind of complicated is because you've kind of created a situation of what we call like false imprisonment, right? Because it would be hard to get off that stretcher bed since the side rails are off. Like it's a safety consideration, but did I just kind of restrain the patient? Yeah, I did. Um, so nurses You'll notice if a patient's sitting in a hospital bed, like let's look back over these pictures real quick for patient transfer. Go back a few steps. You'll notice uh, this hospital bed, when he goes to get the patient, she has a side rail up, but then there's a lot of side rails that are down, right? The nurses are required, if they've got a patient in their hospital room, to have at least one side rail down. But you, you say, well, well, Mr. Roberts, you just said if the patient's left unattended, all the side rails need to be up. Well, there's a difference if they're in a bed versus in, their, in a stretcher. I don't know what that magical difference is, but there's a difference, right? So um, if you go into a hospital room or if you're leaving the patient in the hospital room, um, don't put all the side rails up. But if they're in a stretcher, pretty much just keep the side rails up. Makes sense? No, it seems a little complicated to me, but um, it is a safety requirement. It's, it's two sides of a safety thing. One thing is making sure the patient doesn't fall, so side rails up. The other side is making sure the patient doesn't sue your butt for false imprisonment, so side rails down if they're in their hospital bed. All right, that is it for transfer.